Okay, I'll sing the first stanza and please uh, sing with me if you know it. First stanza says, When I saw the cleansing fountain flow open wide for all my sin, I obeyed the Spirit's wooing. When he said, Will thou be clean? I will praise him, I will praise him, praise the Lamb for sinner slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood can wash away each stain. Does anyone know Stanza 2? I love me with the beginning, man. Go the way is straight and narrow. All I clean was swept away. My ambitions, plans, and wishes are my feet in ashes. Lay. I will praise Him. I will praise Him. Praise the Lamb for sinners Give Him glory, only people, for His blood can wash away each stain. Thank you. Stanza three. Blessed be the name of Jesus. I'm so glad he took me in. He's forgiven my transgressions. He has cleansed my heart from sin. I will praise him. I will praise him, praise him, praise the Lord for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood has washed away my stains. Stanza four. Glory, glory to the Father. Glory, glory to the Son. Glory, glory to the Spirit, glory to the tree in one. I will praise Him, I will praise Him, praise Him, praise the Lamb for sin a Give Him glory, all ye people. For his blood can wash away each stain. Amen. Father, we pray. The songwriter said, When I saw that cleansing fountain open wide for all my sin, I obeyed the Spirit's will. When he said, Will thou be clean? I mean, thank you. Because the cleaning and the cleansing from sin comes by your word, comes through your blood. And because of that, we sit in front of you with a veil of the temple torn, and we can approach the throne of grace. Father, we thank you. Because of this manifold opportunity of being Christian, Lord, in a world that is seeking for answers in a world that is seeking for direction in a world that is emotional in a world that is intellectual in a world that is confused lord we know that we have one answer and that answer is jesus and we know that ordinary man who is living in sin ordinary man who is troubled by anxiety ordinary man who is troubled by the world can come to jesus and be transformed father lord we pray that your name is going to be glorified in our lives even today in jesus name lord we pray that your word as we share we pray that lord you're going to be open our hearts to receive 
we pray, oh God, help us not to look to the right or to the left, not to be distracted, but Lord, that our minds, oh God, will be apt, oh God, to hear and to receive from you today. Lord, I pray, oh God, as we begin this new week, Lord, I pray higher heights spiritually, higher heights in everything we do. We pray you give unto us. I pray in any way that, Lord, you will seem, you will deem fit, oh God, to transform us today. I pray that it will happen in, in our lives. Lord, I am excited because, oh God, the entrance of the word bringeth life. And I pray that the entrance of your word today will bring life. And help us, Lord, to have a great conversation. Help us, oh God, that even this meeting, Lord, will be ordered and directed by the Holy Spirit. We want to thank you for everyone that's here. We bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Blessings to everybody. So we're going to get started immediately. I think, uh, Miss Jola, you have the next few minutes. Would you get us started? Um, yeah. The Bible verse, the chapter we're reading is 1 Corinthians 13. And so as everyone already, oh, do you, I could go ahead and read it real quick. And... We can, I have a few questions that I feel like we could discuss. I could ask those, or if anyone has a question or any suggestion on how this should go, I'm happy to hear. So I'll read First Corinthians 13, I'll read NIV. It says, if I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. For where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. For when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now, we see only the reflection of as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of this is love. Praise God. Hallelujah. I mean, yeah. Can leave this is probably one of my um, best chapters. Probably my best chapter anyway. Because he literally gives Christianity a meaning to me. He gives it, I mean, I know the topic for today is relationship. But I mean, before we go to see love in that perspective of being in I mean, I, don't, I think the relationship encompasses all types of relationships anyway. But before we go to streamline love in that way, I mean, it's beautiful to see love has given meaning to Christianity, given meaning to why we do anything we do. Because there are a lot of people who, they do different things. You see people who have died for different causes. People have fought for Black Lives Matter, fought for um, against uh, different things for homosexuality, against homosexuality, for some have literally died for racism, some have died fighting against racism. But at the end of the day, what's the motive behind all of these things? If it's not love, then it's not for Christ. And then another perspective I'd like to see this from is that First Corinthians itself is not, um, let's say, it wasn't when it was initially 
um, written. It wasn't like, it, it wasn't written in chapters anyway. It was letter of Paul. So, but I mean, so what brought about him, um, chapter, uh, chapter 13 was the question that people, that, we, that was asked that which of the gifts, right, was the greatest among all the gifts. And then he brought it to perspective that if you can do, like, doing all of, like, I would quickly just read um, 12 verse 29. It says, or oh, let me just 27 to um, 31. It says, now you are the body of Christ and members individually and God has appointed these in the church First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracle. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongue. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Or honestly desire the best gift? And yet, I show you a more excellent way. He says that. All of these gifts, they are beautiful to desire, to desire, but having love surpasses all of these gifts. So yeah, so that is my own, um, I say summary and perspective of that verse, of that chapter. So and now I'll just go ahead to just ask a few questions and it's open to us to answers from everyone. And so uh, in verse, I will start from verse two. It says, um, so a question from verse two is just, it says, why do, um, why the spiritual, why does, why did he say spiritual gifts and is nothing if we do them without love? So yeah, that's just my question. Like, why is it nothing? Because if it's nothing, why are people given the capacity and the gifts to even do all of these things, perform miracles, have faith that can move mountain. And if at the end of the day, God doesn't exactly accept it because it wasn't done with love. Because we can see a lot of people, we can see, we can see a lot of people who have all these gifts and can do all these miracles. But we can, we can also say we, they don't have love in their hearts and the motive behind doing these things is not exactly love. Or still, why does God still give them the capacity to do this or the gift to do this so yeah that's my question and it's open to answering and discussion from everybody anybody can, we, can i go sure Please. okay so uh um i believe that as christians um the basis of christianity christianity itself was um, founded on love because the basis of Christianity is that we believe that is in um, John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whosoever believes in him shall have life and so um, that exactly is the basis of Christianity so and that is the greatest commandment for thou shalt love the um, Lord your God. And the second commandment is thou shalt love your neighbor. So the very foundation of Christianity is love. What we preach in Christian, in Christendom is love. What the foundation of Christianity is based upon is love. So... Uh, as Christians, true Christians really have love in their hearts. Uh, it is um, those who don't really, um, who are not really in Christianity or who don't really have the faith in them, those are the ones that don't have love in their hearts. But if you are a Christian, you should have love in your heart. Even um, act of love acts of selflessness in the world today are like um like for example there is um um like there are several um acts of kindness being done to so many people in the world 
And the first question, like for example, um, there were some homeless people in uh, the United Kingdom, in London, where we were like cooked meals and gave to them. And immediately we gave them that meal. The first question they asked us was, are we Christians? And I was like, wow, interesting. Is it only Christians that give food? So they were now like, it's only Christians that actually show the act of selflessness that um, can be attributed to what we just did today. And we were really, really impressed with that act. So the world today has even like associates, associated love to Christianity. So that's just. Yeah, I mean, totally. Okay. You can go, Michael. Okay, yeah. I like the question that you just raised, and it's a really it's something that is actually uh, been a wonder in Christianity. If I may get you right, you're saying that if, why is it that like some people could have gift or manifest in one way or the other, manifest the power of God in one way or the other, and yet they don't have love? Should that happen? And why is that? And am I right? Yeah, even though the even though this verse says that it's nothing. At the end of the day, it's nothing. So they can they have faith that can move mountains, they can do miracles, they can speak in a whole lot of other tongues. But we we probably don't see some evidence of love in their heart. Let's say, for instance, they boast. No, it's really a very, it's really a very scary thing because when you just read, uh, it it shows that people can actually labor for God or do the things of God and yet eventually not get anything in return for it. And like in the Bible, there's a part where Jesus said that uh, people will come to him and say that in your name we cast out devils, and he will say, "Depart from me, I know you not." And for me. It's scaring me. I understand that it's not supposed to be, but from that scriptures, it, it's possible to actually manifest with the power of God and yet still not be acceptable. Uh, and we've seen people like that, that, that there were people, the were Saul, for example, in the, in the Old Testament, actually even prophesied at a time. And yet it was rejected. And I know that... Uh, we have the gifts of God, the gifts of the Spirit, and we have the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, long-suffering, and, and, and hope. And I like I know that it can actually exist when you have the gift, and yet there will be no fruit there. So for me, what I'm instead of answering that question, it just coming to me as a person that what if God uses me in one area or the other and Yet I am not doing it out of love. I'm not doing it in the intention of actually spreading the love of Christ. That means that the labor is just going to, just like, you're just losing weight. Not <laughs> yet, as, as the Bible calls it. It's really a very scary thing for me as a person. And either instead of answering your question, I'm asking myself that whatever I'm doing or whatever I would do, is it born out of? The love for God, love of love for the people, but love for people generally. And love for God. Waste of time. So that's what I have to say. Yeah, but but does anyone like I, I yeah, that, that's great contribution. Thank you, Michael. But does anyone have can anyone help with an answer to why God knows that at the back of my mind I want to be able to heal the sick so I can boost. About God knows that that's the reason, not out of love for the sick, but just to be able to say, Ah, I can do it. But He still gives me the capacity to do it, He still gives me the grace to do it. You know what? What, 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 what I would say is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1 says, For instance, let brotherly love continue. I think. Love is a commitment. It's something you have to personally well up every time. It's something you have to be committed to almost every day. So it's still very possible you are disconnected from the love source or 
the love current, to use the popular analogy people use, a fan is disconnected from source and still keeps rotating even after it has been disconnected from alternating current. So beyond that, I believe love is, is a commitment. It's not something, yes, it's not something you just have only in at a moment. It's still something you have to personally commit yourself to because it's something that can fizzle out. And maybe that is why Jesus told that church, maybe Ephesus, that nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. You have you are forsaking your first love. So it's something one can that can easily burn out if you don't you don't keep feeding it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I agree with that. Love takes conscious effort. Sorry, I have a question on that. Maybe or before anybody wants to contribute. According to what uh, Pastor Binga has said, so are you saying that at the time of the uh, receiving of the grace or the capacity to do something at that time, the person has love and the thing eventually dwindles out? Is that what you're saying? That at that point, you have to have love to get those things? Uh, well, you, the, you have to have at least love which is born out of God's grace to have the gift of God. I know whatever is genuine, we also have a counterfeit. Some other people manifest some of these gifts even without being saved. But it could be counterfeit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, all right, can I say something real quick? Yeah. So, um, yes, Ms. July, the question you were asking about people wanting to perform miracles, well, it's not because they love to pick people. Being but able to, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so, because they want to show off that they can. So, one thing I want to say is, there's a piece in Romans chapter, <laughs> Romans eleven twenty nine. It says, the gift, for the gift, and calling of God are without repentance. And there's another place where Jesus Christ said that um, people will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, we've cast out devils in your name, we've done this and done that, and he will tell them, depart from me, you that work um, iniquity. So when people perform miracles and do all of those things in the name of God, it is because God wants to honor himself and honor his name doesn't necessarily mean that they're in right standing with Christ or they are born again or anything. And it's possible that they might have been, they might have been there before, they might have genuinely received the power of, power of the Holy Ghost and are able to do all those things, you know, um, sincerely. But after a while, they backslid and, you know, the, the Spirit of God has left them. But, you know, they are still able to do those miracles. Because God's calling and gifts are what without repentance is thinking about those sick people and he wants to help them and he's going to use any means, you know. When those um um those people were saying that why don't you tell your disciples to keep quiet and all of those things that Jesus said, these stones would even start to cry out. God can use anything, he can use any means to make his word to you know go how to heal people to do whatever it wants to do you will use any um vessel any argument. so i i don't want you to confuse it with the personal relationship that each person has to have with god you understand yeah okay so yeah at the end of the day it's all to the glory of god and to pray to the glory of god and to the praise of god's name that's why it would let people prophesy and give them the grace to move mountains even though they don't have love in their hearts so yeah that's that's fair now so my next question says that um it's from 
verse 8, it says, uh, love never fails, but there are prophecies with, uh, they will fail, whether they are tongues, they will cease, whether they are in knowledge, it will vanish. So, um, what does it mean by vanish here? What does it mean by the fact that it will cease, it will vanish in this context? What does it mean by it passing away? Because I think NIV says pass away. Um, I have uh, King James here, and it says, okay. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And this is just my own opinion. I could very much wrong about it. I know that there are, there are people who, because of this verse in particular, claim that the gifts of God are not for today, that the gifts of God were for, uh, the gifts were for the times of the apostles, that after the apostles, the prophecy, the gift of prophecy, the speaking in tongues, uh, the knowledge of those things actually left. That was the, that was the interpretation some people gave uh, to it. But to me, I don't think that's correct. I, in my own opinion, when it says whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Me, I'm thinking that as if one has the gift of prophecy, or when one has, uh, the, uh, yeah, or is a prophet, there are times you might want to uh, work in that gift. You might want to minister in that gift, and for some reason, it you are unable to flow, and you might not necessarily be able to explain it, and also. Uh, tongue, uh, uh, anyway, let me talk only about prophecy because the other two, I'm not really sure of it. Yeah, but in my own opinion, for prophecy, I understand that some some people who are gifted in the gift of prophecy or they are in the office of the prophet, they want to minister. And for some reason, they are not seeing anything. They are not able to hear anything. They are not able to connect. So I think in my own opinion, I think that's what that place is saying for that part, but I'm not sure. Okay, that they might feel that they might they might not all they might not they work. Might, they might not, not that work they, every time. No, I'm not saying that the person won't will prophesy and the prophecy will not come true. I'm saying that the person will not be able to prophesy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Tosi has something to say. Yeah, I think uh, the question the question the question you asked, the answer to that question is, is I think it's in verse nine. Say so for we know in parts. And we prophesy in part. So that means that you only know to the level of which you have been given the revelation. So it's possible for you to actually miss it out. When you give somebody a prophecy, it might not actually be the what you have received. And sometimes as well, for prophecy to come to pass, it also involves whoever you are prophesying to. Right? So if the person also fails to do his part, the prophecy also might not come to pass. So that's why I think is saying that the prophecy and tongues and knowledge can fail based on other factors that makes it to come to pass. But charity, when it's done, when love is done, will not fail. Yeah, that's my own opinion about that. Okay. Dana. Oh, okay. okay. I have, okay. I might be wrong with this analogy, right? But I'm going to give it a shot, right? So I think just so picture the life of a Christian as a, uh, a 25 year old man, right? And he's athletic. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think of a, I think of a Christian like a 25 year old man. He's athletic. He's intelligent. He has all these skills, right? And he's a lot. He's able to because he's 25. He's able to run. Or 10 miles without resting, right? And over time, you know, this 25 year old man becomes 40, right? Sometimes he's not able to, he's not able to run the same way he used to run when he was 25, right? Or just different skills are not applicable at different times in his life, right? But 
I think the reason, okay, this is just my thought, right? The reason love is like the essence of everything, though, right? Love doesn't matter what age this man is. You know, it's always going to be the essence of everything. Maybe at some point he could do something, right? And now he's older, he can't do the same thing, right? Or, you know, at different points in his life, you couldn't, you can't do the same thing you used to do. But the essence of everything is love. If you think about the life of Jesus Christ, Jesus didn't heal everybody he saw, right? But Jesus the, had love every time he was around. So the essence was love of God, right? And there were times he healed, there were times he prophesied, there were times he did different things. But the one thing that was consistent all the time was love. Yeah. I mean, that, that puts it in better perspective, yes. Um, okay. All right. Let me give you a different perspective on this. So, Jala, let me ask you, when Jesus comes back, are we going to need prophecy again? I don't think so, no. Are we going to be speaking in tongues again? Mm, I, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> yes or no, I don't know. It's, it's, it's no. <laughs> because so, this says here that um, the, sometimes I see speaking in tongues as tongues of, uh, tongues of angels. So for in heaven, it's possible we are probably able to speak the tongues of angels and communicate with them. <laughs> so I, that's my so, perspective. So a lot of these things, you see, the gifts of, of the spirit, just going back even to the first question, the gifts are things we discover that we, God has already placed in us. We discover them. And, and, and that is why when you look at the world today, there are lots of people that are successful because of the gifts that God has already given them, even though they're not using it for God. You know, and um, in us, when we discover our gifts, that's why the Bible talks about the body of Christ, right? Um, that every part complements the other. Um, so those that preach, they do, you know, if, you, if someone knows how to preach very well, it is important that when it comes to preaching, we find that person who knows how to preach and we put him there. Those that know how to kind of offer hospitality, it is good we find those people and because they will do it, it's, it's, it's almost second nature to them. Um, now, when you consider the gifts and the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, this is something God gives us because the fruit of the Spirit, they, it's the, you know, when you think about patience, man naturally is not patient. When you think about love, man naturally is, is not loving. We know because what the, the Bible tells us, the heart of man is desperately wicked. So these are things because we have come into Christ, the this Holy Spirit that is in us. He said, what peace I give you, peace I leave you. You know, um, so the idea of that is what? The coming of the Holy Spirit is what is producing the fruit of the Spirit in us. Um, but the gifts, I believe, are things that we already have. But we come into Christ, we discover them um, and use them for Christ. So, and I think, um, and, and this is just a perspective. Um, when you talk about, um, what do you call it? Uh, what's the one we're talking about here? So love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. At some point, all prophecies will be fulfilled. You know, and the, the, the whole Bible, basically Genesis, ends up with the coming back of Jesus. And once Jesus returns, what does the Bible tell us? That the Father is going to live with us. And so all that we have left at that moment is the love of Christ. Everything else will be done because uh, the prophecy now is to guide us up to that place. But now that the Father is with us, I think um, uh, basically brings an end to all of these things. I, I believe pro prophecies will cease and the speaking on tongues and all of that. So basically whatever heaven is doing right now with angels and so on and so forth, that's what we were doing once this all, once all the corruption of the world is, uh, is taken, uh, taken away. So um, I believe tongues will cease, um, even knowledge, because what? All we have right now is the knowledge of God. In fact, 
everything that we do is directly related to God at that moment, and we don't have any other kind of opposition. Um, it's just a perspective, though. Um, thank you, sir. And yeah, thank you. I'm going to give um, Jola about five minutes to just round up this session. Okay. And then okay, yeah. move into a, a, a second level of conversation. Go, go ahead, Jola. All right, yeah. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, and this is just my last question after we check the all. So, my question is just, um, so, um, my question, why does um, Paul put such value on faith, hope, and love, those three things in particular? What makes them very important? Because for him to compare love with faith and hope, among other um, groups of spirit, as we can call them, why does he put so much importance on faith, hope, and love? So that's a really good question, actually. I mean, <laughs> why, why not a different three? Why faith, hope, and love? It's a good question. Anyone? If you have stopped, stopped us, Bella. let's please. Why, why faith? No, no, you that's excellent. I'm saying, why, why faith, hope, and love? I think that's a very powerful question, very important question. What makes those three stand out amongst all the g gifts, or yeah, what makes those three stand out? Don't look at me, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not even looking at you. You're just you're already explaining. <laughs> I'm waiting for someone someone to to take to take on that challenge of that question. Maybe this will make us talk. So <laughs> faith brings us to God, right? Yeah. Faith brings us to God. Hope keeps us looking up to God. Mm -hmm. And then God is love. So we have to love basically because he is, because those are the two commandments. Maybe that will open us up to start talking. <laughs> uh, we'll just try. <laughs> Give the shots. So I think we believe by faith. I mean, we accept Jesus by faith and we have hope for eternity, all right? But then, if we don't have love, which is the commandment of Christ, the hope of eternity won't be possible. We'll, miss, we'll definitely miss out of that. And all our faith, our professional faith also will be in vain at the long run. So I'm just thinking right now, like putting everything in perspective, I'm thinking that love will make your faith to be valid and will make our hope for eternity to be secured. Yeah, I mean, those are all very valid points. My own opinion, so I think, yeah, because at the end of the day, there would be no suffering, no pain, no all of those things in heaven. And we, prob we probably won't need the need for peace. We will probably not need the conscious effort to be joyous or in other things. But even in heaven, I would still believe that our faith is what will take us there, of course, and we make, is, one that will, is what will last our faith, our hope, and the love we have in our heart. They are the things that would last longer. They are the attributes that will last longer than even when we don't need joy, even when we don't need, um, even when we don't, we are not craving for peace and other things. So yeah, so in conclusion, I mean, so we can move on to the next. And if anyone has other thoughts on that as well. Um, I just want to um, encourage us to love consciously, to love consciously, to make sure that we think of our love, because it says your love suffers long. So when, even when it's not convenient for us to love, are we still loving? Even when, um, 
it does not envy even when it's not easy not to be envious of somebody else are we consciously loving in that situation it do, it's not, it does not parade itself it does not it's not puffed up it does not behave rudely it does not seek its own and that's that's another a very important point it does not seek its own it's not not just being selfish but it does it doesn't care about himself or herself at all so it does not seek its own. So we have to make the conscious effort not to seek our own. And I think that's a level of God of love God wants us to attain. It's kind of easy to say, I love my neighbor as myself. But as a Christian, are we consciously making the effort to probably love them more and not seek our own, but seek God's own? And then it says it does not be really, does not seek its own, does, it is not provoked. And it thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hope and all things, endures all things. So it's easy for us to say we love. It's easy for us to say we love. Oh, we are Christians. The basis of Christianity is love. I love you. I love all my brothers. I love my sisters. But I, when we when we define our love, does it contain all of these things? If it does not, then we should review our love and make sure that our, our love is able to, uh, will I say, um, pass through some of these, um, some of these tests and pass. So, so I have to say, thank you, everyone. In fact, um, this has been so good because in the the um, general chat, I noticed something that. Um, barrister at the energy wrote he said love it's like mixing a preparing a stew and adding ingredients mixing it love is the fire that cooks it without fire everything fails and um, love is stronger than death and um, mr yoyi also wrote that love in its full fullest meaning is true love to god and man without this the most glorious gifts are of no account to us and no esteem in the sight of God. Doing good to others will do none of us if it is not done from love from God and goodwill to men. And I think a few other people have written. But I want to continue this conversation and I'm going to have a few more questions for us that we're going to go. And Jola started out so, so excellently because a lot of the questions I wrote have been answered already. But I still want to emphasize on a few things as we go on. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I divide 1 Corinthians chapter 13 into three parts. Verse 1 to 3. I'll read that first and we'll talk about it. Verse 4 to 7 and then from verse 8 to 13. Verse 1 to 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I have nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and I have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Now, this scripture jumped out to me. I listened to one of my favorite preachers, probably my top two, three favorite preachers. His name is Leonard Ravenhill. His son came to him one day and his son asked him, Dad, what kind of preachers do you listen to? And really, do you prefer to listen to Armenian preachers or Calvinist preachers or those that speak in tongues or those that don't speak in tongues? And Ravenhill's response to his son was, I listen to preachers that pray. And that summarized it. I listen to preachers that pray. And it doesn't matter what the doctrine was. And the doctrine matters, but... If you're praying <laughs> and you're in connection with God, God, something will fix. Will, that's the most important ingredient. So the reason I brought that up is this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the first three verses, I can almost picture different types of churches in these first three verses. There are the churches that speak with the tongues of men and of angels. No, there are some preachers that we listen to that um, they, they are sweet. They know how to quote from the Greek, quote from the Hebrew, quote from here, quote from there. Okay? And there are preachers that, you know, their own is prophecy. 
and they can explain all sorts of mysteries. And there are preachers who they have a ministry of faith and they can move mountains. And there are people who say all of that stuff is nonsense. They have gone with the past that what we need to do today is to feed the poor. What we need to do today is to sacrifice and burn our bodies and give everything we have. Paul gathers all of them together. I say, if you have all of these things and you do not have charity, nothing of it is profitable. And that, to me, stood out very interestingly, that this love is so important in our Christianity that having all of these characteristics means absolutely nothing without love. And I wanted to go to the next few verses, and I, I'm going to ask a question here. Verse chapter, verse four to seven. Verse four to seven goes ahead and indicates a few characteristics of love. And I wanted to see if we can quickly point out those characteristics of love. So what are the major characteristics of love according to verse four to seven? Is love suffers long. Love suffers long, which means love is patient. Yes. Love is kind. Love is kind. Love is not proud. It's not proud. So thank you so much. In fact, we could keep listing them. And so what I did is there are two categories of things that love is and love isn't. So Paul the Apostle here lists all the things that love is, and then he lists all the things that love isn't. And one of the first things that jumped out to me is, is the absoluteness in which he describes love. The absoluteness in which he describes love. He starts by listing these, seven, these eight things about love. He says love is patient, love is kind, love rejoices in truth, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, rejoices in all things. Now, why this is important to us is that if you know the history of the children of Israel and the history of the Bible times, for instance, the children of Israel came at a time they, when Jesus Christ came, there were people that had been oppressed for a long time. They have, they have in, in 4,000 years at that time, they had been to captivity so many times. They had reason to hate so many people. In fact, at that time, they were under the oppression of the Romans. At that time, they did not like the Samaritans. The Samaritans did not like them. They were a people that were very marginalized. Now, for people that were very marginalized, Jesus Christ came and gave one commandment. He said, love. And that jumps out to you. For people that have every reason to be angry, for people that have every reason to, you know, God, we want you to do something. We're tired. We're tired of where we are. Jesus Christ gave one commandment. He says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. And that jumps out to me. And so Paul here describes what it means to love. And so he describes these things, endures all things, hopes all things, believes all things, bears all things, rejoices. Which... Now, I have a question. Is it possible for a believer to endure all things? Believe all things? Bear all things. Is it actually possible for? I know my, my, the answer might be yes or no, but I want us to think about it and explain. How, how is it possible for a believer to endure all things, hope all things, believe all things? Or do we have any problem with those statements? Is it even possible? I mean, I think it's it's very possible to yeah. So I mean, I think the another version says um, 
it's always it's always trust and always hopes so uh, love always trust and it's always hopes so i think the fact that it's always hopes emphasizes the fact that as we've said before even when every other thing fails it's still there's still hope in love there's still um Oh, what I say, there's still um, there's still hope. At the end of the day, love still contains hope in it, even when every other thing fails. And it also says that it's always trust. I think when we love someone, and even when we bring it to like the earthly, to in earthly terms, like when you love someone, you you clearly believe in them, you clearly trust them you you have hope in them even when things don't even when they don't have hope in themselves even when they don't um believe in themselves so yeah i think it's possible to always i mean you, you have a different version that's, that's different from the way i'm saying it but at the end of it, i think it's, it's it's possible when you actually love someone and you not just someone and you love god then it's possible to always hope in them always um to always trust in them, to always, yeah, believe in themselves. I, I have a comment on that too. Michael, uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, that, I think, okay, I think there's a huge difference between possibility and what actually will be done. Possibility in that case, or in this case, everything is possible, all things are possible according to what God as a Christian, for example, if you are in a, if you are like married, and you, I know as a Christian it's not supposed to happen, but for some reason, it, one of the spouses is like is promiscuous, and probably the person is coming late at night at around twelve, and of course you know, of course you know in your heart, you know that this person is actually coming from an inordinate place, probably a bar or or a brother, for example, and the person tells you that it's coming from the church. And because you have love, you want to believe the person. I know it's possible, but I don't think I, in that case, you even want to believe the person. When you know the person is lying, and then bear all things. I want to use a relationships also to, as an example here. When they have a partner that is not being responsible for anything at all and still is still being promiscuous. How much of that would you bear and then hope that the person will change? In this world of today, it's, it's really hard that we are having cases of even divorce in, in, in Christendom. So it is actually possible, like I said, or like you said, and like your sister Jonah just said, but in many cases, uh, we as Christians, we actually struggle when we actually are faced with this kind of some situations that require us to rethink about our love. Somebody whose child is being killed. Um, I remember someone telling me about the fact that somebody who killed, that one even mistakenly killed uh, the person's parent. And the person is a Christian, but the person said is, the person is still struggling to actually forgive the person. So I don't, it's, it's possible, but it's a very, very hard thing to really do. But with God, all things are possible. Thank you. Brother Kayode, would you kindly? Brother Kayode, then Mr. Yogi. <coughs> okay. Um, can you hear me very well? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, I was just thinking about um, the scenario um, I openly painted about Jesus and the children of Israel and the fact that they have been under oppression for a long time. Um, my own view about that is the fact that the, when Jesus was telling them to love one another, um, you know, there is a way oppression makes you very hard. There is a way oppression takes away, you know, the heart of flesh. 
there is a way of pressure just hardens you and um, all you're thinking about is law, justice, or denances, and all of those things. But Jesus came and was telling them, love one another. People will find a woman in adultery and they just want to stone her. Their conditioning was about retribution, retaliation, vengeance, and all of that. And they, are, they, they were doing most of those things even to one another as Jewish people. And within them, I think that probably they were also divided on a lot of things. And the Bible makes us understand that Jesus was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. So he was telling them to love one another. So I believe that um, when we say love, bear it all things, believe it all things, is it possible in our world? I, sometimes I struggle with that myself, you know. And then when I look at the people of promise, Israel, um, who it's the Bible is about the story of the love of God with this nation of Israel. Once the Palestinian bomb lands in Israel, before you talk and say anything, Israel retaliates, even though I know, yeah, it's Judaism. But for us as humans, I believe that we can endure all things. But I do not, I, I'm not sure if enduring all things means that you sit down there passively and just taking all the blows, in my own opinion. I believe that enduring is that situation where you are, or maybe probably somebody put you there, maybe at work, and you are expected to maybe resign because you are, somebody feels that you shouldn't be in a particular organization, and you're enduring. But in trying to endure, you are outperforming, you are doing your best to ensure that even when there is like an appraisal period, people can attest to the fact that you have done your best and you have also passed, you know, the performance index or whatever it is. So I believe that enduring is that spirit in, 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 in a Jewish person who says our land doesn't bear anything, but we are going to find out how to irrigate and innovate and bring out something. So for me, love believes all things. Yes, but I'm not sure that I'll believe somebody who I know is a is a pathetic liar, you know. So I believe that Jesus was saying that amongst um, the Jewish people or his followers or the brethren who have called themselves Christians. So those are my views. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm right. Thank, thank you, sir. Um, Brother Yui. Yeah. Um, it is an interesting and a complicated question. And yes, you are right to say that the answer is both, both yes and no. Because let's look at the practicality of it. The kind of love that we are called to show and exhibit here is an unconditional love, oh. a divine kind of love. And you cannot exhibit that divine kind of love with your humanness and your flaws as a human being. It requires a strength from greater realm, if you like. Let's take Matthew chapter, um, is it 30? where it says, Matthew chapter 5, verse 39, that uh, if you are slapped on, on this cheek, you should uh, turn the other cheek and all that. Now, if we're looking at all these practicalities as a Christian, it is very, very difficult to be frank, to be able to do these things on your own. It requires grace abundant grace there there's this story that um rabbi zachariah shared about an experience with 
Ahmed did that. While in Malaysia, and he was making a presentation, and there was a Christian professor who was in the, in, 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 in the audience. I don't know if you have heard the story. And Ahmed Didad, a very renowned Islamic scholar, in order, he, he said, you know, to, it's impossible to practice Christianity. And sometimes he thinks Christianity is even foolish and stupid. So he called out this professor who is a Christian in the auditorium with lots of people seated. When the man came up front, Ahmed Dida took his hand and he slapped him. Now it was so hard that this man, it took, he said he, tears and, and the shock and everything was so intense, he turned red almost immediately. But immediately Ahmed Dida said, all right, now turn the other cheek. And the man, by the grace of God, some kind of miracle did that. And he also slammed him another hot slap. But it did not end there. Ahmed Didat went with his assault on this man until he stripped him to his panties right in front of the crowd. And after that, before he, he actually gave him his pants, the man turned to the crowd and told them, I am sorry to do this, but I have to do this. And he removed his trousers and he handed over to Ahmed Didat. He walked back to his office with tears in his eyes and he went in. Now, looking at all this, you will see to our understanding, you see stupidness, you, you, you can't explain this. It takes the grace of God for you to be able to do this. But this is how the story ends. After the whole thing, while the man was locked in his office, Almost 80% of people in that crowd and in the auditorium walked to the man's office, knocked, and each one of them, almost all of them Muslims, apologized to this man. And some of them, because of that simple act, came to give their lives to Christ. My brother, it is not easy. If it were me, probably I would have slapped Ahmed Didat back. That is the truth. And it is so true with love. Even with our spouses, there are some times when they do, your, it's either you or your spouse will do something. And this is someone you say you love. And both agape love and all kinds of love you are expressing to this person. <laughs> but they do something to you. And you feel at some point like you want to strangle them, you know, and all that. And that is just the reality. So it is actually true, true that it is difficult what we are called to do. But with the grace of God and with the help of God, we can truly exhibit unconditional love. But my brothers and sisters, it is not easy. So it is that grace that we shall continue to ask for from God so that we'll be able to do these things, you know, to the glory of God. Thank you so much. Brother Michael? Does anyone else have any thoughts on that question? Adamu? Oh, I just, I just have a question for you. Yes, sir. So when it says believe all things, what do you think that means? That's a good question. Does anyone have Yes, I'm sitting here. When you say believe all things, yes. does that mean even when someone comes and is saying, telling you a false gospel of Christ, are we supposed to believe that? No. Yeah, um, so, and, I'm oh, sorry, go on. 
Okay, that would be verse seven, right? Yes. Yes. So when it says believe all things, I think I don't know. Um, I and I have I don't have an answer to it. It's it just struck me now. Really, that's I can even see the part of bear all things, because, um, again, this is something that you can do. But how about believe? Because okay, can someone telling you now things that are not God? And if you believe that, basically that is taking you to hell. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think another version says trust. So. Now, if, yes, if I may same chip in here, okay. Uh, so it's just, yeah, it's just a thought. Um, so go ahead, Mr. Yoyi. I have, a th I have an answer that I, 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 I want to share, but it's not. Yes, and, 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 and my thoughts or my, my, my answer to this is, this is where wisdom comes in. And that is why God has handed us wisdom to be able to discern also. Because yes, it's, it says we should accept all, all things or, or believe all things and all that. But also remember, we also have wisdom that God has given us. So if you're confronted with this kind of falsehood, you will now have to display that wisdom. And that wisdom comes from the knowledge of God. And knowing the word of God, this will grant you the ability to discern when it is falsehood, what not to believe. Now, here, you might believe it not because you are believing it to accept it to be part of you or what makes you up. But believing it to avoid maybe argument, believing it or accepting it in order to avoid fights and things like that. But you have, let me use the word, common sense. And that should come into play when things like this come at you. Thank you, sir. So um, I don't know if anybody else has a thought on that, but you see, I, and I don't have the perfect answer, but I think Jolad made, did a good job referring us back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 29. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 29, we talk about, but covet earnestly the best gift, but show, yet show I unto you a more excellent way. This scripture was written to the Corinthians. And so it's important also to read, the, to know the context in which it was written. It was written to a church where there was a lot of disagreement, where there was a lot of ups and a lot of downs, where people were uh, speaking in tongues and prophesying left and right. And there was a lot of disorder in the church. So number one, Paul was writing to people who were children of love. Number one, he was writing to people who were saved, who were born again, and who had disagreements and who had issues between them. So it's also important to know that these words, in context, you're referring to people who, um, who, were, who were saved. So when the Bible says um, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, it's also referring specifically to individuals who, you know, in, as, we, as we Christians are spending time together, as disagreements come between us, as we have issues all between us, amongst the children of faith, we must be able to do all these things. Because if we take it out of the context of that and we take it to the world, the world is full of evil, the world is full of lies. As Christians, we do not, we do not, um, we do not live in that realm of evil and lies. So number one, this immediately negates anything that is evil and anything that's a lie. As you can see in verse six, it says, rejoiceth not in, not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. So we are, with this scripture, number one, even before we get into bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things, we must stay within the realm of truth. And it's within the realm of truth that this applies. Now, another thought that I have is that 
a, a preacher was preaching one time, and in this modern age, we like to say, what, what, what did Jesus, what, what, what's that statement? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And the preacher said, let's stop saying that statement. What would Jesus do? The question is, what did Jesus do? When we get confused about how to live in this world, let's just go back and find out what Jesus did. Jesus Christ was a perfect example of endures all things, believes all things, hopes all things, who for the joy that was set before him endured the, endured the cross, despising the shame. So in areas that we are confused and we're not sure what to do, let's go back to what Jesus did. And hopefully what Jesus did will serve as a template for us to know how to, what to endure. Because it was outside the, the realm of truth, when people were gathering in the temple, Jesus Christ did not endure their gathering in the temple and selling. It was outside the realm of righteousness. And so Jesus Christ came with a judgment upon it. And so we must make sure that we guide ourselves with what did Jesus do in all of these things, whether it's love, whether it's faith, just the same way. The Bible says, I, this is great. The Bible says that if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. But if you pray for God to give you your neighbor's wife, God will not give you your neighbor's wife. Even though he said all things are possible to him that believeth. Because it goes outside the bounds of righteousness and outside the bounds of truth. Amen. I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on that. I just wanted to say excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a question. Yes. So, so in this context, Paul was writing to people who were, um, as you explained, they were believers. So does that mean in a way that this kind of love can be applicable to people who are not believers? Is it possible? Can we possibly love them that way too? Can we? Yeah, because we're also commanded to love everybody. So is they, does this mean that as a kind of love we can show believers, but as a kind of love we, 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 we have to show non-believers as well? Does anyone have an answer for that? Adam, please go ahead, sir. So I will take you back to the story of... Uh... Moses and the children of Israel coming out of the land of slavery. When they came into the desert, they upset God so bad that he wanted to destroy all of them. So it's just to show you at that moment, even though God was taking them out, it wasn't because they did anything good. It was because of the promise that he made to Abraham, their father, many, many years ago. And in that moment, had it been Moses did not step in as an intercessor for the people, for the children of Israel, it wasn't just the 20 above that he would have destroyed. He would have destroyed all of them except for Moses. You know, and so, and that is the heart of God that he's looking for. That is the love. In fact, Moses was willing to give away his salvation for the children of Israel at that moment. You know, so and so and that is that is that is the love. That is the love that today, you know, let's even take, for instance, Nigeria. We all hear the kinds of things that are happening, the way Christians are being killed. It's even worse than many years ago. But the only way we can truly love, the only way we can change that is not to take up arms and start killing the Muslims, because all we're doing is we're just sending more people to hell. And the idea of God, what God is doing is, if we would choose it, he will take all of us to heaven. And that is why, because we have to remember, I think it is important for us to keep this in the front of our mind, that death is not the end of things, especially for a Christian. In fact, death is the beginning of things for a Christian. If, you, if we die in Christ, then we have joy for the rest of eternity. So, the, but the, the problem is the flesh in the one hand, you know, what does the Bible tell us that every time a righteous man dies, there is rejoicing in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. So in heaven, they're like, okay, yes, we have gotten one more, you know, into the kingdom of God. 
But here on earth, the flesh will tell you otherwise because of pain and anger. And that is why Jesus said what? You hear that I say, it is said that you should not murder. But I tell you, if you are angry at your brother from sun up to sun down, you might as well just take something and kill that individual because you've hold him for too long. And that is why God, Jesus went back. He didn't stop at the law. He went to the condition of the heart. So we have to remember that as heinous as some of the cri crimes the world commit against the children of God, actually for, for an individual, um, if you remember when um, they were stoning Stephen, when, Stephen, when God opened Stephen's uh, eyes and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, you know, everything didn't matter around him anymore because his death, the power of the Holy Spirit is going to raise him and it's, he's going right into the arms of God. Um, and so it is important. So, and that is why we're able to love, knowing that the same power that lifted Jesus from the grave is the same power we have. And it still has that power to lift us up and take us to God after we've been killed or whatever. And that is why all the disciples were able to stand the kind of death they stood. Where Paul, when they were crucified, is it Paul or Peter, when they were crucifying one of them, he said what? He's not worthy to be crucified as Christ was crucified, that they should be crucified. He was happy to go, um, to go for that. You hear of the martyrs in, during the Roman Empire when, um, when they were being killed. You know, some of them will be singing praises in the fire. Because they know that what they are going home to their father and all of this pain and suffering is completely gone. So I think and it's, it's kind of it's re, and the only way we can train ourselves to do this is by understanding of the word of God. Um, and I always refer to Hebrews, um, Hebrews chapter two, verse uh, Hebrews chapter two, I believe it's five, verse 14 and 15. Let me see if I can find that. You know, I always have a hard time finding the book of Hebrews. Don't worry, I found it. So 14 says, Therefore, since the children um, share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Um, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. You know, so it is important for us to remember that every, the idea is Satan, that is, that is his threat. He is always bringing death. You know, everything that happens, he brings death in our face. You know, and then we we cower down, we are afraid. You know, the reason why Christ uh, was the same, Paul Apostle said was for, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And I think we have to get to that place where we understand that because we're in Christ, you know, whatever persecution we face, even if we're persecuted to death, you know, it is gain to us because we, basically that person is helping us to leave this very wicked world and go to a place of rest. So yes, we are able to extend that love to the world, even though the Bible does not necessarily apply to them in the sense that I pointed out. But yes, the only way we can win them, and that was why Jesus was willing to give his life, so that he would show that what? Though he is God, he's not going to torture and punish us and make us do what he wants us to do. No, he wants us to choose him. Thank you so okay, much. and and to buttress, to buttress. Um, sorry for cutting you out, Michael. You wanted to say something? Sure, sure, sure. Please. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I just want to buttress what Adamu just said. You know, someone once said, "An eye for an eye." The result is an eye plus a little extra for an eye. You say, but this person hurt me and they should pay for it. How much should they pay? That is the question. God alone is capable of answering that question fairly. 
and his word says, Dear friends, never avenge yourselves. Leave that to God, for he has said that he will repay those who deserve it. Don't take the laws into your hands, your own hands. Instead, feed your enemy if he is hungry. And if he is thirsty, give him something to drink and you will be heaping, coal, heaping coals of fire on his head. In other words, he will feel ashamed of himself for what he has done to you. Don't let evil get upper hand, but conquer evil by doing good. And like I jokingly um, express with my friend, and we say this often when we were growing up, right from high school, and we'll, we'll say, love your enemy, because it will drive them crazy. Hmm? So love your enemy, it will drive your enemy crazy. It's, it was something we said as kids that we, you know, out of fun or maybe for the love of the, 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 the statement, but years down the road, this is Christianity. This is what is expected of us, to love all unconditionally. The kind of love that Christ told us to love is not the a normal love. If you love your brother or your friend, then what have you done differently? You know? So Christianity is extraordinary, if you like. And it requires extraordinary effort and extraordinary commitment for you to do that. I know it's not easy, honestly, for us, but, but it's, we just have to keep praying for God, for that unction, for that grace to be able to do all these things. Thank you so much. Brother Michael. I, was, I, had, I had a question to ask, but I think if you ask the next question, I might be able to okay. put it in. Okay, Brabondi, go, go ahead. Okay, if I, if I can understand the, the last question in another way too, I, I will say like um, we've read in Corinthians and like I rightly told us, um, Paul the Apostle through the help of the Holy Spirit was uh, given the Corinthian church the guiding principles of the children of God that um, need to dwell among brethren. She asked the question that, um, does it mean that um, we exercise sin as well with um, those that do not know the Lord? Well, um, the Yoyis have, um, I mean, the Kadiris have rightly uh, spoken. In um, Colossians 4, verse 5, it's a walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without. Because like we read in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, maybe that should be verse 7, he believeth all things we don't believe all things that uh, um, a person that do not know the Lord says, because like uh, Ephesians tells us, we know that they are controlled. We know the spirits that controls them. We know the spirit that speaks through them. We know that um, the thought of the heart, um, many a times is deceitful. So uh, we don't just ignorantly say, oh, since uh, because of the love of God and um, uh, we've spoken about love and because of that, we just um, believe them in the heart and the spirit of love. We are to walk um, with them in wisdom. And um, it's on this ground also that, you know, uh, a believer that knows the Lord is not to have uh, any union um, as relates uh, to marriage with um, even an unbeliever. 
because how will um, she or he, you know, express um, this principle of love, like um, the scripture tells us, like we are meant, you know, to express it. So towards those that are outside, we are to walk with wisdom, but we are still to love them. We are still to love them. So let me just leave it at that. Hope I've not confused us. Thank you so much. Um, because of time, I, I don't have, I have quite a few questions, but there's a, there's a question that I want to ask before we, we go. Um, there's a question that somebody, something that I, I, that came up today, and I might ask one or two more questions. Say, God could have come, God came through Jesus. You know, I was listening to Raven Hill today, and he said something. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, Jesus Christ could have appeared on top of a mountain and showed himself to the world. You guys crucified me. But no, he did not appear in, in, on top of a mountain. He did not, you know, show this great manifestation of himself. Rather, he showed himself to his disciples and to a few people, and he showed them the holes in his hand. So the question I have is, and not trying to interpret the mind of God, but just for conversation is, why did God choose to demonstrate his, demonstrate his resurrection? And this is where the goal is to talk about the love of Christ. Why did God choose to demonstrate his resurrection by showing to a few people rather than appearing to the entire world or to Israel at the time? And this, you can compare this to what the Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, 2, 3, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, what was the effect of Jesus Christ revealing himself in this subtle way rather than in a bold, magnificent way after he rose from the dead? I don't know if my question sort of makes any sense. Yeah, like why didn't God actually show up in this time where there's camera and there's internet so that everybody will actually know that he actually died physically and went to the grave and then came back the third day, yeah, right? The entire world saw him die. So, yeah. so if he had rose, if he had yeah. risen again and just appeared, it would have been magnificent. But he didn't yeah. do that. Why? Uh, well, let me just give some um, literary explanation to that in my own little way. Um, the disciples um, had been with him. They've had um, so many things about him. Even while he was with them, he had um, told them about what he came to do and um, uh, how he will go about it, even though they do not have an understanding of that. And even while they were with them, he was grooming them, he was training them so that they will be a witness of what he will do when he is gone. So as a result of that, when his death came, when it happened, and uh, after his resurrection, you know, they were aware, uh, he, he opened their knowledge, he opened their understanding so that they can remember what has happened and what he, he usually tells them. So now when he is about living, because there will be witnesses of what has happened and that of even his resurrection. So that is why those people are the people that know, those people are the people that um, 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 believes, they believe his word. So that was why that happened, you know, before, before them. And that's why everywhere the disciples went, they say we are the uh, witnesses of these things. Everything from his messages to his death and his resurrection and to his ascension. So they are witnesses of all um, those those things. So in my only literary way, that's the explanation. I will, Hello, um, Thank you so much, Brother I think they would they wouldn't still have believed even if he had appeared on a mountain to 
show that he resurrected because they actually knew that he resurrected. They had another interest they were protecting. And they were they quickly wanted to give money to those to those guards to bribe them. So many of all these things, they actually knew. They knew he saved others. They told him, even right on the cross, that he saved others, that and he could not save himself. So so many of all these things they knew, but they had each ears, they were adamant and they had their place of eminence to protect. So ordinarily, as Brother Bondi said, they were not, not that they were even ordinarily unbelievers. They were not willing to believe. So they positioned themselves in a state not to believe. Sometimes, one time in Acts, they went on to even say that a notable miracle has been performed amongst us. And but to shut this man's publicity from going wide, let's do this and do this to these disciples. So I just believe that they might they wouldn't even still have believed, even if he had appeared like that. I have something to thank you. Thank you. I I yes sir. Yes, I think that. God, Jesus, is a master strategist. All the other gods show themselves, Baal, and all of that, and people are not really connected to them. I think what God wants and what Jesus wants is to dwell in the spirit of man. So coming to demonstrate that I am God, all that gods have done that. The stake is too high for Jesus to you know, do that, resurrect and show himself to other people and for people to now make a monument out of it. It's not in their class. So it's got to be in the spirit of man. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and, and, and to build on the statement on the God being a master strategist. And the first thing that came to my mind when you said that was in the scheme of things, it was not time. Because the time for his glory is going to come. And based on God's master plan, that was not time for it. Oh. That was just what came to my mind. True. Thank you so much, sir. Michael, you have something to say. And then yeah. my next yeah, although uh, Pastor Miga said exactly what I was going to say, but I just want to add, add a few things. Though it's just a Yoruba proverb, uh, it, Yoruba used to say that only we are Okay, we are Meaning that no matter the process or the procedure, the outcome is constant. Maybe the procedure is being is robust or not robust. The, out, the outcome will always be constant. I think that if Jesus had come showing himself, people would still not have believed. Because even in this moment now, there are arguments about facts. You know, when you look at this world where you see things that are just so obvious, people still argue about it. They, they try to disbelieve it. So I think that believing is not about what you see, it's about your mind itself. And another thing I really wanted to add is that were there people getting saved or were there people actually going to heaven before Jesus' death? Of course. Were there people that were not? Yes. After Jesus, during the time of Jesus, were there people going to heaven? Yes. Were there people that are not? Yes. So the, the timing might not really be important to the people or the number of people that will be saved or not. Because God at sundry times has revealed himself to everybody. So whether he came in from in, for, in form of the death of Jesus or whether he has revealed himself in the Old Testament, the way he did, people that will be saved will be saved. And people that will not be saved will still not be saved. So that's just my own opinion about it. Thank you. Mercy then, Dr. Kadir. Yes, I think I think all I've been said but do you remember the story Jesus gives about Lazarus and the rich man when you know um, they both died and the rich man from hell was like send people 
to the head to tell my brothers that this is there's um there's torture here and they shouldn't come and join me and all of that. So um it 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 doesn't matter if Jesus had come, you know, showing himself and all of that. People will still find a reason not to believe. And apart from that, based on what we were saying, um in first Corinthians thirteen that we read, he said um in verse in verse um in verse four, that charity suffers long and is kind, envieth not, charity vaunted not itself, is not puffed up, and does not behave in itself unseemly. So if if Jesus had done all of that, the devil would have succeeded because all of those things um that that Satan did at the beginning where he tempted him and said, um fall down and worship me, you know, if you I will give you the whole world, all of those things. That 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 would have been that would have really like um giving the devil the upper hand because all of those um coming out, showing off and saying, Oh now I'm I'm resurrected, it should have just made the devil so happy. And the victory that he got at the beginning we just are filled. And also love, the love, the real love that Jesus Christ had in dying on the cross and going through all of this agony. It wasn't to make it wasn't to make you know people to it wasn't to show off. It wasn't to show off. It was actually to to get people to repent and to actually accept what he had done and change their ways. So Jesus Christ was focused and he made sure he maintained that spirit of love throughout when he was here, when he died, after he resurrected. And that's why we must follow his steps. Thank you. Dr. Kadiri, and if you guys can tell that my son is a preacher. He doesn't like not <laughs> I don't think he's given a chance to speak. Dr. Kadiri. Yeah, so um, I think what Mercy kind of summarized, um, I kind of just wanted to go, take us back to the, the love uh, chapter where he says, um, you know, love is not puffed up. So the idea of opening up at that moment would be that, okay, if love is not puffed up, then him showing off to basically show his enemies that, okay, you know, I got you. Um, would kind of make him, you know, basically he's not practicing what he preached. So, and and that goes with um, that goes with uh, Philippians two, where it says, um, uh, "Let me see if I can find it." Who, although has existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing uh, to be grasped. At this moment, still. Even though God, uh, God said what? After Jesus had done what he has done, that he would what? Make he, he, he will put basically every knee, every tongue, and everyone basically will bow to, uh, at the name of Jesus will bow, right? So the idea is the, the work has not been finished yet for Jesus to appear as God, as he would um, in, the, in Revelation. And, and, and there is time for that. And, and that time is coming where he will come back and those enemies that pierced him will see him, you know? Um, so um, I think one of the reasons um, that could, that, that probably was one of the reasons. The other thing too, also, we have to remember that what? God created man for his pleasure. And how does he gain this pleasure? That man chooses him, right? So by, by him basically, um, impressing himself as someone pointed out Baal and all the other gods kind of want to force you to like them. He, God doesn't do that. He shows you love, you understand his love and you choose him. And I think it is important because that is why the Bible tells us again, what blessed is he who hears and believes. You know, um, so I think that is also important. And then the case of people even believing, remember in Revelation, the other day we were talking about this way, it says what? 
God poured out his wrath on the earth. You know, and the people knew that God had the power to take away their pain and wrath and all of that. They, instead of believing in God and, on, and repenting, they what? They instead cursed God. So it just shows you that it doesn't matter um, what um, we do if the heart of man doesn't make that choice. Um, it's useless. And it doesn't matter what display God has done. What display is greater than, what is it? Greater love has no man, you know, than one who dies for his friend, uh, you know. And so, and this is basically, it doesn't, so what more display are we looking for? If God will come and suffer death for our sake, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, his resurrection and all the glory and all of that, it doesn't matter. And that is why even when he comes at the end, all that glory that he's coming with, the people that have chosen not to, you know, not to believe in him, not to obey, not to worship him, will still not do it. Because there will be a, long, a lengthy period of time where God is going to show his power. You know, thunderous voices and all the crazy things that when, when you read in the, in the book of Revelation. But even with that, there will still be people that will be adamant to believe. So, um, and I think he did what is right, what would really bring the heart of man to him, which is dying on the cross for man. So the show doesn't really matter. And that is because, again, he wants us to believe and to choose him. Um, because if he now starts, do, the, the, if he starts doing all of those things, then he's not different from all the Baals, all Satan. Because Satan always, what he does, what? Is to force you to, to, buy, to, to worship him. Thank you so much, sir. I think we're going to have one more comment from Bar Barrister Adeniji and then we'll round up. You have uh, something to say, sir? Okay, I don't know if he, if he hears me, he'll come back. But I want to say thank you to all those comments because, in fact, if you look, I have lots of notes written down. And brought being hit on some of my notes when he um, talked about the church in Ephesus that had left their first love. And then we hit on some of my notes when he brought up Moses. And everybody has hit on uh, some of my notes. And I want to say there's a hymn, before I hand over to Bracken to round up for us, there's a hymn that was written many years ago. And I want to read a stanza of that hymn to you. It says, Those dear tokens of his passion. Still his dazzling body bears cause of endless exaltation to his ransomed worshippers. With what rapture, with what rapture, with what rapture gaze we on those glorious skies. When Jesus died, he came to Peter and John, eh, those ordinary people, and he showed the scars in his hands. And Thomas, Thomas reached out his hand to want to touch it. They had an appreciation for, the, for what Jesus Christ had been through. They could understand his passion. They, they felt it. They, they grasped it. You know, sometimes we forget that we're more like, we're, we're children of God and we're created in his image. And what's the image of God? The Bible says God is love. God is love. See, even we humans, nothing, miracles will not move us. Love moves us because that's how he created us. And so if he came with a dazzling show, he didn't create us to be moved by dazzling shows. He came and created us to be moved by love. And that is why he himself, every heart that he has ever saved, he saved with a careful interweaving of love. Every heart he has ever saved. So it would have been completely pointless. And I want to say thank you to all those contributions. And the reason I brought this up, it is important for us two that live today that we must show the same love. We want, some of us, we want power. We want victory. We want all this demonstration. And those things are good. But... If we are going to save people, we are going to save them through the same type of love that Jesus Christ saved us with. The careful interweaving of his love that he had upon our hearts. And so we must love. The last story that I have is the story of George Mueller. There's a story about George Mueller. George Mueller prayed for a man all through his life. 
That man never gave his life to Christ. They said that it was at George Mueller's funeral that that man gave his life to Christ. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love bears all things. And I believe that if we, like Christ, spend more time loving, and we needed to define what love was, and that's why we went through this. And I want to say thank you to Jola for starting this and to everyone that commit, commented. We needed to define what love was, and that's why we went through this. I'm going to ask Mr. Yoi to speak, and then Brother Akin, please, you can wrap up. You know, I, I just wanted to add to the man who prayed for the other person. He prayed for him for 52 or 53 years. I read that story recently. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And he did not, the, that man never gave his life to Christ during his life. Until after his death. Until after his death. And if God has given us so much love, we ought to love the same way. And though I speak the, with the tongues of men and of angels, and I have not love, I am like a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have my PhD, and though I have all faith and I can move mountains, and I have love not. I have not love. I am nothing. If I give everything I have to feed the poor, if I'm on the street every day feeding the poor, and if I give my body to the burnt, and people say, hey, yeah, that man, he gave his life, or he died, on, he died saving those children in the fire. And I have love, not love. It has zero profit. I always like to tell people, as much, one of my greatest heroes is Martin Luther King Jr. But when Martin Luther King Jr. gets to heaven, they won't ask him, how many black people did you lead to freedom? That would not be a question that comes up at all. The only question that would come up is about what did you do with the love of Christ? Bracken. Thank you. I want to appreciate um, the grace of God in the life of every one of us. I don't know what summary I'm going to make with um, what um, Brian just said. I appreciate the way Stajola put forth the conversation of today. But just please permit me to say these few things I just pinned down. Number one, I said, the way of God is not the way of man. To be like God, we must live the life of God as presented by Christ. The demand of Christ for man is unfathomable by carnal man. To love like Christ, we must live above all forms of carnality. Persecution is an indispensable part of Christianity. If it was done to the master, then we should expect it. Brethren, please understand that we are not of this world. A sinner cannot love no matter what gifts and benevolence he shows, he must necessarily embrace love to give love to others. If any man seems to manifest love, without love, he is lost. There are many things that we do not, there are, there are many things that we do that confuses the world as Christians. Let's leave not to conform or convince the world or to confound them with the life of Christ that we live. We need to let our lives count only for God. The world is evil and wicked, to say the least. We need real grace that comes from the power of godly and biblical prayers to be able to love. Brethren, please I urge us and plead with us. The world will always love its own, but we eat us. Therefore, 
Let's love each other. Let's care for each other, for one another. Let's be interested in one another's welfare. Let's support each other. Because the days are evil. Each one needs the other. I need you, you need me. If the world will love its own, then we Christians should love each other with pure love fervently. If the world fights, we should love one another. Love gives time, love shares, love cares. Let's love purely and surely, and let's love sacrificially too. We cannot love enough until we have prayed enough. Brethren, I thank God for this study of today, and I am praying that the Almighty God will knit our hearts in the love of Jesus Amen. and it will give us the understanding and the comprehension of what it means to love with pure love fervently. Let's hold up each other. No matter what we are going through, we are living in a time that is indeed hard and difficult. People are going through stress, going through frustrating moments, difficult times. Families, the devil is raging wars against homes. People want to share, want to talk. Unfortunately, not many want to listen. Let's give out of our time by loving the brethren, by caring for the people of God. Of course, let's love the sinners too, with the love of Christ that took him to the cross and he bled out all his blood to redeem them back to him. Let's care for them too. Let's pray for them. As we come to Bible study every Sunday, let's not just come with the mind of just amassing knowledge. Let's come with the mind that with all the lessons the Lord will bless us with, want to go back to the world and translate those lessons from our heart to practical living. We cannot love the world until they have seen that we are Christ's followers. The early Christians show forth that they are of God because of the life they live. The Lord will give us grace. I have a saying that I normally say, what I normally say, I say, it may be difficult to love in this present world, this present evil world, but brethren, it is possible. Not based upon us grace, strength, and might to love like Christ. As I've been told us today, let's not ask, what will Jesus do? The Lord give us grace to live practically and do what Jesus did. The blessing of God be upon all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Brother Mayo, would you pray for us? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, Pastor Denny, do you have something to say? No, 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 I'm, I'm fine. Okay, okay. Sorry. Brother Mayo, please pray for us. Dear Jesus, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity to fellowship together. Thank you, O oh God, for the, 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 the study. Thank you for reminding us of the love of God. Thank you, O oh Jesus, for the teachers that taught this evening. Thank you, O oh God, for all the inputs that was brought up. I pray, O oh God, that you would write these words in the tables of our hearts. I pray that these words will change our lives, that we would not just hear this word, but these words will actually change our lives. I pray, oh God, that you would just help us, oh God, that we would have a genuine love for God, and we would have a genuine love for the brethren, the Christian brothers and sisters, that we have a genuine love for the sinners. I pray, oh God, that you would just Help us, oh God, that our lives would be all for you and would be all about you. I pray in these times that are uncertain, in these times that a lot of things are out of place, 
help us, Jesus, that we would constantly keep our eyes on you. And we would not look to the side. We would not look, to, uh, we would not look on our side, but we would keep our eyes on you. Father, help us, oh God. Help us that the love for our neighbors would spur us on to preach the gospel, to tell the lost about the about Jesus, about the love of God. I pray that you give us a passion for it. I pray you give us a heart for it. I pray, oh God, that you would bless this week. I pray you bless everyone's work or school or everything we have our hands to do. And I pray, oh God, that you would keep us safe until we meet again, I pray, oh God, that you would just bless our families. I pray, oh God, that you would just, with our lives, oh God, that everywhere we go, we would be a channel of blessings to others. Thank you, Jesus, because I know you've answered. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Um, I just want to say a few things before we go. Thank you for staying. Um, uh, one of the things that I, I have on my mind is that, you know, it's a privilege to gather together with all these wonderful people too, every Sunday. And I just want us to sort of know that, know some of the, know a little bit about each other. You know, so I won't go through introducing because we don't have time. But I'm going to say, if, mention a few things about a few people. And if, you, if, I, if I miss on you, please don't forgive me. But I just know that over here, I know Pastor Bondi, uh, has a church that he pastored in um, in Lagos, and I. And so, if you can pray, keep praying for them, and also, I mean, if you if you pray for them, if you give to them, because I know it's a it's a Pastor Bonde is a, a big man, but a lot of the members of his church are not big people. So, <laughs> so if you pray for them, if you give to them, that's wonderful. Um, I know that Bracken leads a prayer meeting every morning. If you need prayers, if you want to pray every morning at 5 a.m. Boise time, you know, I can connect you with that prayer meeting. And um, um, and that's meet at noon Nigerian time. I know that um, I, we found out today, I know my, my broadband guy's dearest, dearest friend, and my friend, um, Barista Deniji, I started a program, African Revival Center. Ark, sir, you want to speak about that for a second? <laughs> um, yes. Um, ah, it's just um, a body. Um, and I think I have carried it for a very long time. Binga knows about it, about Africa, about Nigeria. So we just believe that at this stage, right now, um, what God is saying is that we need to put that message across to bring the black man back to Christ, as in to let the black man know that um, Christianity is not a product of colonialism or slavery, that God has the black man in mind. So that is the reason why we're having the African Revival Center, changing the thinking of the black man, and especially people here in Africa, you know, and in all parts of the world. So I believe that it is time for God to show his power and for God to show Christ's power by, you know, changing the destiny of the black man. I think it's a miracle that needs to happen before the world comes to an end for people to know that God truly has hand in the affairs of men. So it's a YouTube channel and then um, we're going to be uh, preaching every week, uh, basically, but it's not a church. Um, so I would never be a pastor, you know that. <laughs> so it's just going to be like that. Uh, so for the next one year, we're going to be uploading content on YouTube. Um, so that's that's about it. Okay. Thank you, sir. What, what did you say the name is once again? Africa Revival Center. Okay. And I know that. So those are the ones that I'm mentioning now. I know my other brethren are, are also actively involved in a, diff a few different things. But I want to know if if I miss any key one, I know Pastor Kibiono goes up and down the mountain, but um, we'll leave things for another day. So uh, as we round off, I just, instead of, um, we have a, we don't have a hymn, but I want to share my screen with you people. It's a very important share that I want to share with you people. And I want you to go with this in your heart. Let it inspire you. This, 
I hope. <laughs> let, let, let my boy inspire you. Be happy. And uh, God bless you all. <laughs> Have a wonderful rest of your day. I don't feel like going again. You don't feel like going again. <laughs> Have a God bless everybody. And uh, thank you, Jola. Thank you, everyone that stayed from Nigeria. Mr. Princely, it's good to have you back again. We've missed you. And uh, thank you, everybody. Please, uh, those of you that are still around, keep, please, please pr keep praying for students. They've resumed school here in America. I know Precious is back in school and she's um, already doing her thing. So please, let's keep praying for schools, uh, students to stay safe from the coronavirus and everything. At least I know, and then the others will be resuming school soon. All right, if there's nothing else, I don't know if anybody else has anything else to say. I, I just want to say that I want to appreciate Sister Jola again for the lesson. I don't know why she actually turned off her video when she finished the lesson. I don't know if that's allowed. So please. <laughs> are you the uh, which prefect are you now? <laughs> What, are you labor prefect or what are you now? He's <laughs> admin. Admin, is that? Is admin, okay. Uh, labor prefect. <laughs> I'm here. Just say that you want to see me. <laughs> All right. Let's do boys you matter to boys. We leave them to do their own while after. God bless you, everybody. All right, bye, everyone. <laughs> Have a good day. Bye. Have a wonderful day. Yeah, bye. Thank you so much, Jana. Thank bye. you. Bye, guys. Bye. I do have a question. Have a I do have a question when uh, everybody is gone. Ah, are you waiting for the mood to leave? Ah. Okay. Uh, but uh, Miss Kathleen is still here. Maybe she could. Miss Kathleen is still here. Yeah, the question is, you know, I was, I wanted to raise it up that with, with uh, love and kindness, they are, they are different, right? And they will, we mostly interpret love to be kindness. And people, like when they said we should love sinners, how much of loving do you want to do for sinners? I see that, I'm just thinking hypothetically here. When you go and give somebody food, and uh, the person eat the food, and eventually go to hell. What's the essence of this? You just waste mineral resources or different. My point is that we've we've actually like made made uh, love to be synonymous to kindness. So I wanted to push it out there that what is love? We know what righteousness is. Righteousness is. We know righteousness is. Do not steal, do not lie, do not do all these things. We know what long suffering is. Long suffering is just accepting pains. We know what faith is, you know, believing the word of God and trusting. And we know what kindness is. We know just help the poor, just be nice to people. But love, I don't know. We, uh, is it really, I don't really have a full definition of love because you could do something that might look like love which will also lead to the death or to the uh, to a cal calamitous uh, end to that person. So what is love in this entirety? That's my uh, question. Phoebe, I'll, give, are you I'll give my, my, my two cents. And, um, and I think that what you're trying to say, I don't know if the word kindness is what you're trying to say. I think you're trying to say the word niceness. See, kindness is a fruit of the, is part of love. So if you remember the scripture, um, um, Galatians chapter five, it says, and the fruit of the spirit, not are, and the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, long suffering, meekness, kindness. kindness. So the fruit of the spirit is not all, the, are not many things. We have the fruit, one fruit of the spirit, and that fruit of the spirit is love. It is joy, kindness. It is all of those things. So it's important to know that. Now, why, why, why is that important? If I say Michael is, Michael is not just his hand. Michael is not just his nose. Michael is not just his leg. Michael is all of those things together. So the fruit of the spirit, when the spirit of God comes in you, 
It doesn't today give you kindness and that or tomorrow will give you love. No. Somebody even said that, do you know it is impossible for an unbeliever to be humble? And I believe that. An unbeliever can be two-faced. An unbeliever can be a lot of things. An unbeliever can be plain. But an unbeliever cannot be humble because that is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, a non-believer cannot love agape because that is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, they can love eros, they can love ilio, they can love other types of love, but agape love they cannot love. Now, when love comes into your heart, when the love of God which comes into your heart, it has so many um, facets or so many ways in which it is reflected. And one of the ways in which it is reflected is kindness. Another way it is reflected is it's goodness. Sometimes it's meekness. But that love, when it comes, it comes and it reveals itself in different ways. And that's why the Bible says that um, do good to them that despisefully use you. Be kind to them that use you anyhow. And you heap coals of fire upon their head. And so I think kindness is not necessarily something that we can work on these things. But ultimately, it is a gift. It is the fruit of knowing Christ that you just become kind. You don't even know why you're kind. You become kind because Christ who lives in you, the hope of glory, is revealed. And you don't even know why. And that's why Jesus Christ did so many. The Bible says he went around the earth doing good. Mm-hmm because of that fruit of the spirit in him which is kind now another problem is people mistaking kindness for niceness i can be nice and be evil i can be nice and not be kind i can say sweet words i can compliment every woman i see that's niceness that's not the fruit of the spirit a man can be stoic angry angry faced and all of that and still be loving because being nice and being kind are two different things in fact, being nice is not, it, it, it's not a requirement in the Bible at all for anything. So we don't, but we need to be kind. I don't know if that's my, that's my two cents. See, a lot of them who are, but Mr. Yo is the good. They are the ones that would have. No, no, no. I, um, you, you actually answered to my question, but. No, I'm... Ooh. Okay. Ooh. Yes, when you said an unbeliever cannot be cannot um, be actually kind, I've actually met so many unbelievers that are that are very kind, like that are truly, truly kind. Like when I mean it's not as if they have like like I've met so many unbelievers that don't even believe that God exists. They've been truly kind. They can practice. So, see, love, for instance, I've met unbelievers that have shown me love, right? But to love as a nature is not in them. That's why the Bible says it's easy for you to love your neighbor. Uh -uh. Phoebe, there are people that will give you water. They'll fly. They'll do whatever it takes to come and give you water right now. But you spit on their face and see if they will still give you water. You try it. All of those people, see if you spit on their face and they will give you water. That is the standard of Christianity. The standard of Christianity is not, if I'm good to you, you'll be good to me. Or if I'm neutral to you, you'll be neutral to me. The standard of Christianity is the story of Corrie ten Boom. Corrie ten Boom in the World War II, her family was killed by the Nazis. When she got out of prison, and she was taken to jail, when she got out of prison, the first person she visited out of prison was the soldier that killed her family. That is not something the world can do. It's not even possible. And so it's, and that's why we Christians sometimes, and that's why, you know, right now there's a movement here. The move, it's easy to support black lives. It's hard to love the racist, Abby. If somebody is racist, one of us will carry them and throw them away. You try loving Zacchaeus and you try loving um, the tax collector. It's easy to support me. If I, if I, if I come out now, you can support me. I'm a very, I'm a very nice guy. Oh, poor black, poor black man. It's easy. It's a good thing to do, the right thing to do. But you try loving the wrong person. 
love that woman on the street who spits at her face. She's not wearing mask and she's, 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 she's all raggedy and she's like, go back to your country. Try loving that person for a second. That's not something the world can do. And that is why it's not possible to live a life of love without Christ. It's just not possible. Because Jesus Christ, sometimes I was reading the story of Jesus Christ. The same people that called Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, were the same people that said, crucified him. And when they were crucifying him, the Bible said, he said not a word. Ah, when I was reading it, my heart was boiling. I was, I was speaking on behalf of Jesus. I was angry on his behalf. It's easy. These things are easy. And that's why we, I'm not, we, we can't be moved by when people are nice or kind to us in, 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 because we are good to them. Love is when, like the story of the Samaritan, Israelites are not supposed to help Samaritans, and Israelites did not help Samaritan on the streets. Did not help the man on the street. And there was a Samaritan that, that helped that man, an Israelite. So it's, it's easy. The world is wrong. The world is failing. The world Does, the, does it mean that if someone wrongs one, like if you, you've, been, you've been badly hurt by someone, and then you feel hot like for a moment and then afterwards and then you just um like my kind of person is a, is a kind of person who will actually oh like i don't um when someone does something that is not bad that is evil to me i i feel hot at that moment like i don't even want to have anything to do to do with the person and then, but like, I don't talk, I don't speak. I just leave the person completely. And then, um, like, I sort of think it through and just forgive the person and just um, kind of just let it go. Just um, forgive the person. If it's something I need to talk through with the person, I call the person. And But if it's someone I can no longer see, and if it's someone I can no longer like talk things through, maybe the person is a complete stranger to me, then I just forgive the person and just let go. But like at that particular moment where when it happens, I get hurt, but I don't speak, I don't talk. So does it mean that um, the perfect work of um, the Spirit of God is not complete in me? That's yes, why yes, I still yes, feel yes, hurt yes, and angry. Yes, <laughs> No, it doesn't mean that. In fact, to be hurt is normal. Jesus Christ was hurt. There were times that Jesus was hurt. To be hurt is normal. What makes you a Christian is being godly in spite of the hurt. After you've taken in the hurt and you're like, you know what? And that's why Brodinga said, love is action. Love is not, the Bible says love is patient. Those are action words. <laughs> love is action. You have to sit down and say, in spite of this hurt, me, I don't think many of us understand what love, hurt and love is. A few years ago, I had something that was very painful to me. And for the first time, it was like God was saying, it is time for you to really show what love is. Forgive us, Lord's Prayer, forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. To trespass means to, to, to come against you. You forgive those who come against you. So you're okay, Phoebe. You're okay to be hurt. It's, you don't stay in there. The Bible says that let not the, the, the sun come down upon your anger. But, and, but you can't, the truth is you can't come out of it if not for the grace of God. Mm. And that's why we see all these divorce rates in America. There's divorce rate, there's murder, there's killing, there's people shooting down people, there's protests. It's because we're not rising above our human emotion. Our, our human emotion is responding the right way. The right way is be angry. That's the normal response. But to, if there was anybody that really needed to protest, his name was Jesus. And the Bible says he did nothing. He did absolutely nothing. He just went to the cross. And so to love is to go against every fiber in your flesh. Every fiber in your flesh. And somebody says, yeah, let's go. These people, they have they burned down my car. People will tie at my back and say, where are, you? Where, are you? where are they? No. So love is to say, 
Merci, sorry. Okay, so, see, yeah, this thing that we're talking about, we should remember that it's not, it's not something we have to use our own power to do. She yeah. gets Like, in fact, we can't even do it ourselves. We need the grace of God. And and that's why when it took on I said, if any man be in Christ, if a new creature, all things are passed away. Build all things are becoming. So, yeah, there are things that we see in ourselves, but it's not supposed to make us afraid. Or, like, oh, oh, I don't have love. Or, I don't, maybe I'm not kind. Maybe I'm not. You know, if you notice these things, it's very, very, very simple to just go to Christ and say, give me grace for this. Because at the point, at the point where you start making all this effort and saying, I'm beating yourself up and saying, oh, I'm, I'm not doing it right or, you know, things like that. It's, that's not what God is asking us to do. He wants to give us grace. He wants us to do it freely, automatically, without trying to have. That's the whole point. Not, you know, I mean, that's that just, we shouldn't, we shouldn't look at it like we're trying so hard. That's just the point I'm trying to make. And if, if the Holy Spirit calls your attention to something that, oh, wait, what you just did now is not, is not what a Christian is supposed to do. He's, he's not doing it to condemn you, you get. He's only saying it to make you a better Christian. And all you have to do is, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Give me grace so that I, I don't do this again. And just give me grace to be better. That's all. And all of a sudden, you have the peace in your heart. And you find that uh, you're able to be kind. You're able to, to not be envious. These things come because Jesus has already, you know, he has already gone to the cross. He's already done all the hard work. He's done the hard work so that we don't have to. Yeah, that's been good. Thank you, you are for it. You, you are right. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Blackie? Yeah. You know, Sister Messi said something that just struck me now. And I think you had said something like that earlier. We don't seem to understand the depth of the topic we delved into today. Honestly, we don't. You know, Bible says something in the book of Matthew chapter 6, I think. I'm not too sure now, but it's the book of Matthew. It says that, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Christ has burdens. It's go to yoke that is placed upon Christians. Oh, don't seem to know that this yokes abound. And if we must live the life of Christ, we must carry these burdens. We must bear this yoke. And personally, I have found out we can't be a Christian until Christ has crucified us. Paul said, I'm crucify with Christ. We can't love until there's this work of God wrought in our lives of crucifixion. There are things that may look good and pleasant. I was telling somebody earlier yesterday, I mean, sometimes yesterday, I said that all things may appear lawful but it's not often that I experience. Christ's followers need to know that, that all things may appear lawful, but they are not experienced. Talking from a personal perspective, I had an encounter with someone whom I was kind to. And guess what? And this person happens to, I mean, by his profession, a Christian. And he did all kinds of things, acted in all kinds of way. And I was so hurt. Ah, I was badly hurt. And guess what? 
I was bent on doing what I wanted to do, just to kind of push him to the edge. I was right, yes. But push him to the edge whereby he will be so kind of in a fix. But while I was thinking all these things, I told myself, I said, look, no matter how bad anything may be, I'm going to be a Christian. But in the midst of the hurt, I tried to validate some things. I spoke with people and I tried to appraise my actions. And eventually, I went back to God in prayers. Oh, sweet hour of prayers. Sweet hour of prayers. When I went to God in prayers, God told me, say, look, this man is a man that is ready to die. You want to kill him? Why not just leave him to me to deal with? God tells with him. He is, as, as we will say, a Christian, but I tell you, you know, 1 Corinthians presents to us different kind of Christians, carnal Christians, stubborn Christians, selfhood Christians, sometimes unkind Christians. And this fellow, when God deals with him, I was amazed. You know, we listened to his sermon one day, and as the preacher was preaching, my wife was encouraging me. He said, look at what the preacher said. Listen to what the preacher said. He said, answer him not a word. By the time God dealt with this individual, he came himself, he called me, and he said, for all that he said, for all that he did, he was sorry. I fear God. The thing he didn't want to do that I said, go this direction. The hand of God was heavy upon him that he came back to that thing. Even though I still see evidence of stubbornness and wickedness and all of that in him. I'm not bothered. Because I know whom I believe. And I'm persuaded. Brethren, Brian, I think we need to revisit this topic from a different perspective so that we can understand that it is not of it that we will let it. It's not of it that run it. We need the help of God. Maybe our prayer meeting, maybe this is should be the next thing. We'll pray for ourselves and pray for the brethren. That God will just give us that kind of heart to just love as Christ will love. Yes, sir. If the Bible says that this kind go not out, this is one of the things. So this kind cannot be achieved. Like Samir said, you know, put forth, put it. We can't do these things by just trying to be mechanical, trying to fix it, trying to, okay, I, I try to uh, achieve it in this way, I miss it in that way. No. And like you said too, you can't be kind today and loving tomorrow. We have to just add the fruits. The Lord will help us. Amen. Yeah, I'm present. To you. you know that me, I'm looking for Jesus. Please, if you know where he is, come and tell me. I want to be like Christ. I want to. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be humble. I'm not trying to flatter myself or anything. I'm just saying the truth. The way I feel, I want, to, I want to know God. And we can't know God until we have known law. If you dissect any part of Christ, what you find is law. Dissect any part of Christ. Before King Agrippa, before Festus, look at Black of Paul. Before the, the Sanhedrin, before the area, just check him. Before even disciples. Look at Peter now. Look at just, I mean, look at Peter now. Uh, uh, Apostle Peter, our big uncle, just blew the thing. After experiencing transfiguration, no, he just blew the thing. And then denied Christ. Ah. And how many of us have denied Christ? At the slightest provocation, we just blew it. And the slightest temptation, we just blew it. And yet we say we love God. You know, there's this song that, some of we know this song very well, I guess. Your brother is sinning, and you're able to help him in his need. I'm sure you know that song too. You let him go. And you advise him to pray about it. 
We talk about love, we can't care. We talk about love, we can't pray. We talk about love, you see your brother going the wrong direction, going into error, going into sin. You threw it with your eyes and you see you love. Where is the love? You see all these sinners around. I will say we love. Where is the love? We see believers going into error. If we cannot do anything, I don't know whether you're you sharing with me. Please just permit me to just talk. I mean, I'm sorry, but please let me just. There's a friend of mine. This friend of mine, back in the days, in the 90s, we spent time, we fasted and prayed for his soul. And guess what? He pains my heart for that friend. He's married now. He divorced his wife. A child of God, fucking to the Lord back in the days. And now, he seems to have plenty of money. But guess what? He's living in divorce, living with the second wife. And it pains my heart. And we need wisdom to be able to communicate the love of God to them that, look, we love you, but we can't put up with your, this way of life. So please, this is not something that is just, um, we should just, you know, treat with a uh, hand of levity or something. It's a serious matter. If we must get to heaven, if we don't have anything, we can't, but, you know, we can't dispense this. We can't, we can't, we can't, we can't trivialize this love. We must have it in our hearts. Between husband and wife, between father to, to children, in our school, in our families, in our workplace. Love, 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 love all the way. The Lord give us grace, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, well, I, I won't say much. We've, um, we've said it all. So, but my sister Phoebe, um, it's normal when you are wronged and um, you feel it. It's normal. And uh, that shows you you are a human. But um, the initial anger, if I can put it that way, that's the limit to which your being human should take you. Anything beyond that is not Christ-like. So anything beyond that means you need to uh, visit um, Christ that he may perform this work that we've been uh, speaking about in you. So people will wrong you. You might feel hot, but you don't keep the records of the heart. That's when you are showing the life of Christ. And very important, important, importantly, when you are lost in God, when you are lost in Christ, you will naturally radiate this life of God. You will naturally show love, kindness, and all these um, uh, spiritual traits, Christ-like traits that we've been talking about. Thank you. Rapunde, thank you so much. Because of time, I, where I have to end the meeting. My wife is going out. I want to say thank you a lot. My wife, you have unmuted your mic. You want to say something? Did I? Oh, oh she's there. Good. All right. Well, well, I'm not to tell her not to punch anybody. <laughs> thank you all. I look forward to talking to everyone during the week. I'll reach out to everyone. Thank you again. God bless everybody. All right. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Bracky. Thank and you. And our young preacher for us. Ah, he's hearing. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> he's hearing you loud and clear. <laughs> Bye. Okay.